About a year ago, November 2021, the BBC ran this article. It says a Chinese food live streamer says he has been blacklisted from an unlimited buffet for eating too much. Now, I don't know if the picture is of the buffet owner or of the guy who ate too much, but this is a picture of one of those guys. The man, a Mr. Kang, told Hunan TV that he was banned from the Handadi Seafood Buffet after a series of binges at which he consumed three and a half pounds of pork and seven pounds of prawns. <laughs> Mr. Kang said that this, the restaurant is discriminatory. I can eat a lot. Is that a fault? He said, adding that he didn't waste any of the food. But the restaurant owner told the same reporter that Mr. Kang was putting him out of pocket. This is what the owner said. Every time he comes here, I lose about $80 in the U.S. $80, he said. Even when he drinks soy milk, he could drink 20 or 30 bottles. When he eats the pork, he consumes the whole tray. Usually people use tongs to pick up prawns. He uses a tray to take them all. <laughs> so I guess the unlimited buffet is only unlimited if you only have a certain amount that you eat, right? Well, we're in this series called God Is, and we're looking at the character of God, that is who he is, as revealed in Psalm 103. And because Psalm 103 and all of the Psalms are poems or songs that were sung, we've gone kind of full bore creative. And if you have a chance, if you're in the area and you have a chance to be with us, every week we have Diana Rex who's painting her response to the passage. This is the, the painting she did last Sunday. And, and to actually today after church, we have a painting workshop. Uh, so you can come and learn how to paint clouds if you want. We've put a lobby. We've put a lobby. We've put a board in the lobby for people to write poems and prose and make little drawings and creative ventures. And, and so uh, give it a try. You don't have to sign your name or anything, but, but just try, use this as a way to reflect on Psalm 103 and to respond to God, even if it's just a poem that you write that nobody else reads. That's our challenge. So this series, God Is, so far we've looked at the fact that God is good, God is just, and then last week Scott talked about how God is compassionate. Today, I want to talk about how God, unlike the Handidi seafood buffet, God is unlimited, for real. God is unlimited. I want to talk about what that means for us. Before we do that, though, let's go to Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5, and read them together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I hope that as we have read that first part of this psalm every week that it has begun to soak into your soul and, and made a difference. So today we're in Psalm 103. We're down in verses 15 through 18. I have this one in print here. <laughs> it says, As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Now, there are three themes that kind of jump out at me as I studied this passage and, and tried to discern what it means. And so here is the first one. And this one comes through really loud and clear. We are limited. <laughs> We are limited. Our lives are short. Verses 15 and 16, just come right out and say it. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. Sherry and I got a vase full of hydrangea flowers for pastor appreciation, and two Sundays later, they look like this picture. Well, what's wrong with them? Well, they wilted, of course, because they're dead. <laughs> and by the way, it's not just because these hydrangeas were cut. I, I researched on it, and, and even if they were still connected to the plant, hydrangea blossoms only last a few weeks. That is, they're here today, and they're gone 
next month. And that's what this psalm is saying. It's, as for us, our lives are like grass. Scripture teaches us that A, life is short, and B, rather than trying to ignore that fact, instead, of, instead we need to keep that fact right in front of us and live our lives in light of the fact that our lives are are sure. Let me give you a couple places that Scripture talks about this. James 4.14 says, How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. Psalm 39, verse 4, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my head. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you at best. Each of us is but a breath. Well, Kendall, thanks a lot. That is such a cheery topic that you're bringing up. Why would I ever want to dwell on the fact that I am going to die? Well, there's actually a reason. This one comes from Psalm 90, verse 12. So listen to what it says. It's a prayer. It says, teach us to number our days, Lord, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to keep in front of our faces the fact that our lives are short so that we may gain wisdom. Now, when Scripture talks about wisdom, it means living my life under God's authority, living my life in God's presence, living my life for His purposes. Because as I do, I experience the joy and, and, and uh, experience His joy, and I learn to be satisfied in Him in every moment. But the problem is we don't naturally lean toward biblical wisdom. We don't naturally lean toward that way of thinking and living our lives before God. We tend to lean toward our own wisdom and our own ways of thinking and living. And our own wisdom tells us not only to ignore the brevity of life, but to suppress that truth and try to convince ourselves that, hey, I actually have a long time. And as long as we're healthy, we can actually maintain that illusion, and we do it pretty well. Puritan pastor and writer Richard Baxter put it this way. He said, man always knows his life will shortly cease, yet madly lives as if he knew it not. And I think that's like, that, that just captures it, right? We know somewhere in the back of our mind that it's someday there's coming, but I'm going to try like mad not to think about that, and I'm going to live my life as if it's never going to happen. But, the, but, but that kind of mad living, guess what? It impacts the way we think. It impacts the way we act. It impacts the decisions that we make and the purposes we pursue and the priorities we set. And typically, when we lean on our own wisdom, that does not include God and His purposes and His plans and His priorities and His presence and the life that He wants and longs to give us. So scripture tells us over and over, listen, your life is so short, so learn to number your days. Cultivate a sense that your life is brief and that it's not about you. It's about knowing and experiencing and loving God and letting him use you to help other people do the same. So while we're on this section, here's my question and reflection for you. How are you using your one and only life to know God and to pursue Him and His purposes? Listen, don't live your life. Don't make your decisions as if you're going to live forever because you are not. And the older you get, the faster it goes until one day it is upon you, and no matter how old you are, when it comes, it's always surprising. It's always too soon. And so Scripture says, listen, learn how to number your days, and then use them to know God. Use them to pursue His mission for you while you're here. That brings up a shameless plug that I want to make. Our next intro to Discovering Your Design, Discovering Your Mission is Sunday, December 11th, right after church. If you're in the area, come and join us. It's only an hour. It's an introduction to discovering the purpose that God has for you and living a purposeful life. How are you using your one and only life to know God and pursue Him and His purposes? All right, let's keep going. Verse 17, Psalm 103, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. 
and his righteousness to children's children. Here's a second theme that comes up. First of all, we are limited. Secondly, God is not. (laughs) We are limited. God is unlimited. God is everlasting. God is infinite. God is without bounds. Those, the, the, the phrase everlasting to everlasting and to your children's children, those are two poetic ways of saying the same thing, which is although our lives and our dreams and our plans last only for a moment and then come to a swift end, God does not. God will always be. He is unchanging in his person. He is unchanging in his attributes. He's unchanging in his presence. He is unchanging in his plans. God never ends. And therefore, his steadfast love never ends and his righteousness never ends. And then if you just go backward up through Psalm 103, his compassion never ends, his mercy and grace never end, his justice never end, hence his goodness never ends. His redemption and his healing and his forgiveness and all his benefits toward us never come to an end. There will never be a time when God says, whoa, time's up. I am done healing. I am done forgiven. I'm tired of extending mercy and grace. I'm finished satisfying your soul and renewing your heart. (laughs) There will never come a time when God does that because God is un. Limited, and that means that everything he is is also unlimited. As a matter of fact, for those of us who follow Jesus, when we step into eternity with God after our short, brief, grass like lives are over, we will only experience God's attributes and, and, and the parts of his character more than we are now, more deeply, more richly, more intensely. And because God is unlimited, because God is infinite and eternal, there will never come a time when we have experienced all of God there is to know. There will never come a time when we go, okay, God, I know all about you. I get you totally. No, he's infinite. We can never exhaust who God is. And every moment of eternity, if if there are such things as moments... (laughs) In eternity, every moment in eternity, we will discover and experience new facets of God's life and God's character. And we will be in a continual state of wonder and awe at God and his character and his creation. We will find ourselves saying all the time, that is amazing. I never would have have dreamed anything like that. I, I can't wait to find out what's next. The classic writer A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, puts it this way. He says, how completely satisfying to turn from our limitations to a God who has none. How completely satisfying to turn from our limitations to a God who has none. For those who are out of Christ, time is a devouring beast. But before the sons of the new creation, that's us, before the sons of the new creation, time crouches and purrs and licks their hands. (laughs) We live with the God who is unlimited and offers that to us as a gift. In 2019, Kevin Berger wrote an article for Nautilus magazine, and he touched on this idea that we are so limited and we fade so Quickly, it's, it's entitled, How We Will Forget John Lennon. <laughs> and in this article, he, he cited a study by MIT researchers who were asking this question. How do people and products drift out of the cultural picture? And in the process of this study, they traced the fade out of, of songs and movies and sports stars and patents and scientific publications. They, they drew on data from sources like Billboard and Spotify and IMBD and Wikipedia and the U.S. Patent Office. And then the team designed models to calculate the rate of decline of the songs and people and scientific papers. And here's what they found. They said, people and things are kept alive through oral communication for between five and 30 years and then they are forgotten. <laughs> you spend your whole life 
building up this thing that everyone's gonna remember for, and on average, you'll be remembered for five to 30 years, and then whoosh, you are gone from the public consciousness. You see, if, it, if it's just me and my plans, if it's just me and my life, if it's just me and my kingdom and me and my legacy, the best I can hope for, according to MIT anyway, is 30 years. On the other hand, if it's me and God's plans, if it's me and God's life, me and God's kingdom, me and God's purpose, then guess what? It goes on forever. It's unlimited. You can experience the infinite, never-ending God, and you can leave an infinite, never-ending legacy when you join him in his work. You can be part of something that will honestly never end. I mean, talk about purpose and joy and hope and significance. You can have a hand in what God is doing and something that will never end. As, as I move my gaze from my own limited self to the unlimited God, I move from those wilted flowers and dead grass to eternal life and never-ending meaning. Okay, first theme is my life is so short, I am limited. Second theme is God is not, he is unlimited. Here's the third theme. It has to do with this phrase, for those who, okay, we're in verse 17 now, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And then verse 18, and to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. So here, what it says is that God's unlimitedness, all right, God in all his infinity, that is for those who fear him, for those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Now, Scott talked last week, uh, but, but to fear God, when it talks about fearing God, it, 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 it does mean to be reverent, but, but it's, it's much deeper than that. It also includes an element of actual fear. Okay, now, not the fear that God is out to get me, because he's not, or not the fear that I can never measure up to his perfection, because I can't anyway, and not the fear that God has given up on me, because he has not and he will not. But to fear God, and here's how I define it, to fear God is to reflect deeply on and allow myself to be overwhelmed by his immensity and his power and his magnificence. To, to fear God is to let his hugeness overwhelm me. Picture yourself standing at the lip of the Grand Canyon with about half your foot hanging over. If you're there right now in your mind, like you have butterflies, you have vertigo, because you know that if you slip, you are going to die. Okay, that's a healthy fear, right? Or, or, or picture yourself being on a spaceship that's orbiting the sun. Now, now, even if the sun was a conscious, sentient being that deeply loved you, okay, <laughs> what would happen if you got too close, if you flew too close to the sun? What would happen? You would be vaporized, not because the sun isn't for you or doesn't care about you, but because your body simply cannot take that kind of heat. And, and that's what God is like. He's, he's huge. He's powerful. If, if we saw him, we would vanish. In C.S. Lewis' book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Mr., a character named Mr. Beaver, who is a beaver, <laughs> he describes Aslan, the Jesus figure, and Aslan's a lion. So he describes Aslan, the lion, the Jesus figure, to one of the children who find themselves in Nar Narnia. And this is what it says. Aslan is a lion, the lion. The great lion. Oh, said Susan. I, I thought he was a man. Is, is, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about, about meeting a lion. <laughs> safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. To fear God is to cultivate that sense that although God is good, he is not tame and he will not be 
untamed. God is wild and glorious and breathtakingly beautiful in the kind of way that sends a tendril of fear through your body. All right? Fear God. And then it says, keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. That word keep there in the Hebrew it means to observe or give heed to or pay attention to. Last Christmas, Zach uh, went to a Christmas party and he brought home these 3D reflection, refraction glasses. And, and so when you put them on, everything in the room looks like this picture. All right? Snowflakes, okay? Every point of light, when you're wearing these special glasses, every point of light turns into, it broadcasts a snowflake. Everywhere you look, you see snowflakes. You could be in the Mojave Desert, put on these sunglasses, and everything, every point of light would look like a snowflake because, a snowflake because those glasses, they become the filter through which you see the world around you. Okay, so to pay attention, to give heed to, to remember God and his covenant is to make God and his covenant the filter, the glasses through which you see the world, the glasses through which you make your decisions and use your time and spend your money. To keep and to remember is to be purposeful about your relationship with God It is to put the glasses on, that is, develop spiritual habits that keep Jesus always in front of you and make you aware of his presence so that no matter where you're looking, you see him, you know he's there, you cultivate this awareness that Christ is present and I am present to him. That's what it means to keep and to remember. And no matter where you are, you follow him. And, 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 and if you can do this, the people who do this are the kind of people who experience the unlimited, everlasting love and presence of God in their moment-to-moment, everyday lives. Now, at this point, somebody might be thinking, okay, but Kendall, didn't you say a couple weeks ago that God's love and goodness is unconditional and it's offered freely to everyone? I mean, God, God's love is perfect and his goodness is perfect and his kindness and compassion are perfect and he offers them full bore to everyone, right? Yes, but here's the thing. Just because it is offered to all does not mean that everyone can or will embrace it. God's love and compassion and mercy and justice and goodness and healing is unlimited in every way but one, our willingness to receive it, our willingness to let it in. God's loving kindness, God's steadfast love is offered to everyone through the person of Jesus, but not everyone wants it, not everyone wants it receive it. Only some people fear God and keep him near and remember him and give ourselves to him. It's kind of like the paintings Diane has been making. Here's the one she did two weeks ago. And, and, and we have on, on Sunday mornings, we have them up on stage for everyone to see. But listen, if you close your eyes, <laughs> if you close your eyes, you cannot and you will not see The paintings, you will not see the beauty. It doesn't mean the beauty isn't there. It's just that you're refusing to open your eyes. And so you'll never see it. You'll never touch it unless you open. And guess what? The same thing is true of our hearts. God's love is here. His righteousness and his beauty are here and they are unlimited and they are offered to any and all but only those who are willing to admit that their plans and their purposes are limited, only those who are willing to exchange their own kingdom for God's kingdom, only those people who open their eyes and see him, only they will experience his fierce and unlimited life and joy and presence. We must choose to open our eyes or we will never see it. We must choose to surrender our hearts to Jesus or we cannot experience it. Author Peggy Noonan wrote a biography of John Paul the Great. She's talking about the Apostle Paul, and she talks about, she writes about learning to see and experience God's unlimited nature. 
she came to faith later in life. And this is what she writes. Here is something I began to feel after I had faith. The unexpected joy of living things. At some point, living things began to seem precious to me, and I wanted to pet them, hug them, babies and dogs and lizards, whatever. For me, the great fruit of belief is joy. There is a God. There is a purpose. There is meaning to things. There are realities we cannot guess at. There is a big peace, and you are part of it. God is good, and near Him, I love this, near Him is where you want to be. There is something called everlasting happiness, and St. Paul, a fiercely imperfect man who was a great man, was granted visions of it, and that great user of words was floored by it and said that no one can imagine how wonderful it is. The human imagination cannot encompass it. So open your eyes. We are limited. We are grass. We are flowers that wilt in two weeks. But God, God has no limits and he invites us in our limited selves. He invites us to step toward him into his everlasting goodness, to open our eyes, surrender ourselves to him, and experience a life that only he can give us through Jesus. How do you need to respond to this part of Psalm 103? Let's reflect for a minute. Here's the first thought. First of all, we are limited. Our lives are short. Our time is brief. Are you in denial about that? (laughs) Or maybe where are you denying this truth in your life? Where are you pretending that life is not short? Where are you pursuing purposes that will not last? And how might your life be different if you surrendered your limited life and plans and purposes to God and exchanged them for His unlimited, everlasting life and plans and purposes? Folks, this is why Jesus came and died on the cross and rose from the dead to make that exchange possible. It happens when you make him your Lord and your leader and you give yourself to him. We exchange our limited for his unlimited. Here's a second reflection. God is unlimited. How are you limiting him? The truth is God is unlimited, but how are you limiting him today? In what way are you not embracing his everlasting love and goodness and purpose for you? And how would your life change if you did? If you stepped from the wilted grasslands of you, your limited life into the unlimited and beautiful and fearful goodness and beauty of God. Let's pray. God, in our honest moments, we know that our lives are so brief and we are so limited and we try so hard to fight against that, to ignore it, to pretend that it's not true and yet it is. And so I pray that you give us the courage to come face to face with our limitedness. And at the same time, then, in in that limitedness, Lord, we we, we drive us to you, the unlimited one. The one who offers us eternity. The one who offers us life now and after this life and purpose and meaning now and after this life. Lord, we thank you that even though we are weak and fragile and short (laughs) and brief, and limited, you embrace us and invite us into your unlimitedness and into your joy. Lord, give us the courage to surrender ourselves to you in a new way today. Let your presence flow in and through us, through the person of Jesus. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, have a great day. 
We'll catch you next time.